people joining. Tonight, we're, uh, this webinar is on root cellars and cold storage. And we want to thank everybody for joining. I think it should be a good one. We've got a good range of speakers. What I'm going to do, uh, uh, my name's Bob Cervelli. I'm um, uh, one of the steering group members for Transition Bay. Um, a little bit about Transition Bay. We're coming up on 10 years old. Wow, next year. We're gonna have a big blowout party sometime in the spring and uh, might be virtual, but we're gonna do it anyway. Uh, we're part of the international transition movement started in 2005 in England. Uh, it's gone viral. There's some 90 transition communities in Canada alone. Uh, the whole idea is for communities to empower themselves, uh, to be buffered against global changes, largely related to energy, economics, and the environment. So we do a whole lot of um, skills and uh, related types of workshops, projects, that sort of thing. A lot of them are related to food. We've done a ton of different things along the way, and tonight is going to be all about root cellars and cold storage. So that's a little bit about what we do. We are all volunteer, um, quite an active uh, group of people that come out to all of our different uh, projects and things. Upcoming schedule, uh, it's not even yet on our website on uh, March 25th, Thursday, at the same time, we're gonna have a webinar on rocket stoves and solar cookers. Um, if you wanna know about that, we're gonna have a number of people talking through that. Sometime either in January or February, we don't have a date yet, we're hoping to confirm soon, uh, Nikki Jabor may be on to talk about greenhouses. Uh, so stay tuned for that one, check our website on a regular basis and we'll get that information up there. Uh, for tonight, um, what we'd like to ask is if you could put your questions as we go into the chat box and um, then we'll be looking at those. We can pull them out and uh, hopefully we're going to have time at the end. This is 90 minutes in length altogether. Hopefully we'll have some time for some good um, discussion uh, with everyone. Um, I would ask that you stay on mute, um, you know, because if the dog barks or something else like that happens, the screen doesn't jump over to you and can stay on the speakers. Um, we are recording this event as well, and uh, we should be live streaming it into Facebook. Uh, we had a little bit of a glitch earlier, and, and hopefully we'll get around that and be able to do some live streaming. So without any further ado, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce David Wimberly. Um, he's had a fascinating project over the past uh, weeks, a month or so, uh, installing a brand new modern uh, root cellar into the basement of his home. So I think it's going to be a classic example of how anybody could do that uh, if they've got a basement or a partial basement. Uh, David is a longstanding member, co-founder of Transition Bay. So David, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, so uh, I'm just delighted to be able to share my brand new root cellar with all of you. Um, I'm going to immediately go to sharing screen. And then um, I have some a, a keynote to, to share. And then I've got uh, going to share with you the basic plans for this. And uh, since it's all going to be recorded, uh, especially on some of this, you will then be able to go back later and look up the plans uh, and uh, get the, more uh, the details out of it by, by looking at it and slowing it down. Um, but all of this would be something that you would reinterpret for your own situation, for your own budget, for your own situation. I was just phenomenally lucky that this uh, TV series called Eyes for the Job, um, done by AMI, um, has once again um, chosen to do a project with me. And this time it's a really big one. It's uh, putting a root cellar and cold room in my semi-finished basement. And it's a very modern take on this classic 
food preservation system. So um, here's, here's the look of it finished from the outside. You're walking, you're up to it in the basement. It's sealed off from the rest of the basement uh, so that you can provide the proper conditions to store foods of many different kinds. And uh, it's sealed on every um, wall. All, all the outer walls, it's sealed across the top. Um, and I'll show you more details of all of that as, as we progress along this. Come right on in and see how this is an exterior door, even though it's inside, because we really need to keep uh, temperature and humidity inside. And you can start to see some of the vents there in the background. Uh, up high to the left is the little vent that takes warm air out. And then the longer vent, it seems to, from the picture, come right out of the light fixture, but I assure you it's not. <laughs> it goes right down to the ceiling on the, on the left. And that's bringing the cold air in from the outside. Uh, there we go. So um, you look inside, um, here we have shelves on the right-hand side. Um, and again, you see the cold air vent there in the back going down to the bottom. You see a little wire going across and that's where uh, one of the fans is. Um, you can see that the floor is, oh, it's concrete, basic concrete at this point. And um, along the side wall you see there where it's um, got multiple layers of insulation and ceiling. And in the back, you can see that there's insulation on the back wall um, about halfway down, but uh, lower down um, and the bottom two and a half, three foot is uh, open because that's to an exterior wall and it's underground at that point. Uh, so you get, you're trying to capture the coolness from the earth. Here we're looking at the left-hand side and you'll see um, a control panel. And this is um, electronic control panel inside that plastic box that um, allows me to go in with a smartphone or computer and view what the temperature is um, in the two rooms and in the outside and uh, see what the humidity is in the two different rooms. And I can turn on um, um, two, van two vents fans uh, in each room. So four fans total. And I can turn these humidifiers on and off. Now uh, we're looking in and in the previous um, uh, sh uh, shot, you would have seen a little door on the left-hand side. Now we've opened that door and we're going into the cold room. Now there's a separate uh, room for high humidity and another one uh, for the low humidity. Uh, and there's a, a good reason for that. Um, uh, here we're, you know, some, some foods and, and don't really um, like to have the high humidity and others uh, demand it in order to, to store well. They both need a coolness. And in particular, I have, this is my pump room. So uh, I'm making this room something that I will keep the humidity down a little bit. Even though you do see a humidifier in there, it won't be turned on very much at all. Um, now here's close-ups of some of the vents. Again, uh, in the upper right-hand side, you see the air exhaust vent and you'll see a little fan motor there stuck on the bottom of it um, with control wires. So that's the warm air exhaust. The warm air is hotter, so it will exhaust from the top and uh, will, through natural convection currents, even without the fans, there'll be some movement when the outside is a lot cooler than the inside and the cool air from the outside will flow down through the, uh, the tubing on the left-hand side down to the floor. And you can see there that there is uh, a wire about halfway down where the solid pipe meets the uh, expandable um, piping. Uh, there's a vent, a vent fan in there controlled by the little small wire you see going across the wall. And uh, you also see um, a darker wire connected to a little white box 
and that is a Wi-Fi connected box. It just turns the current on or off and that allows me to control the humidifier there from the outside. Now, uh, here it shows the fence down a little bit lower just to show that the um, tubing for the cold air intake goes all the way to the bottom where it's cooler. And you can also see clearly here where along these outside walls, uh, it's the exterior concrete there. But at this point, it's down more than three feet below ground level. So it's gonna stay pretty cool and radiate a lot of coolness in here. Uh, this is a picture of the outside vent. Uh, there's four of them in a row along uh, the north side. You can see how close it is to uh, ground level. It's just as close to that ground level as uh, you can pretty much legally do. You can see the vent construction here where uh, uh, we've uh, drilled exact size of hole that we needed um, into that first um, uh, very thick, heavy duty board on top of the concrete wall. Um, and uh, this is an early stage in construction, but it's really well sealed. And later on, of course, we uh, in that vent that I showed a minute ago, it has a screen in it so that critters can't get in or out of it. Um, here's three stages of insulation on the inside. It shows where we, um, uh, on, on the, the, the sides, which is an exterior wall, you can see the, there's rock wool layer in there. Um, you can see on the ceiling where it has this cement board. Now, the, um, now above the cement board is um, a double layer of that rock wool. And above that is vapor barrier. And uh, there's also vapor barrier behind this layer of rock wall in the, the wall you see. The, um, the light fixtures are all designed specifically for high humidity situations and all the light fixtures, uh, every electrical outlet are all ones that are designed for high humidity, really important. Um, along the left-hand side, um, that white material there is a foam board and that's along the upper part of that exterior wall where it's not as cool as it would be lower down, especially in the warmer months. So here you see the vapor barrier going on um, first and then the rock wall going over the top of it. And then later on, we're gonna put the cement board over that. Um, here we see the crew filming the different parts of it. And this went on for a number of days where they would come in and, and film this. This is gonna be an episode of the show, Eyes for the Job, which is on AMI um, Entertainment. And this is the fourth season they're filming. This, this episode will probably be sometime next fall. Uh, they don't have a schedule yet for it, but you can go and, and watch a lot of episodes if you have any kind of subscription that allows you access to AMI. Now, the fellow in the center is blind from birth, but his father was a carpenter and he um, taught this fellow how to be a carpenter because he really wanted to uh, when he got to be about six years old. Uh, he convinced his dad to, sh to uh, teach him how to do that as a blind person. And he's really confident and jolly and safe and He's done several different shows, uh, episodes out here in St. Margaret's Bay. Um, we had him out um, riding a front end loader um, and uh, milling hemlock boards from trees. <laughs> Can you imagine um, a, a blind fellow operating a, a portable sawmill? It was so amazing and so uplifting. And he made a, um, um, a coal frame um, that for Bob's garden and some um, um, raised beds for me. And then um, another year he did uh, some raised beds that go, went into, into my greenhouse. Um, 
And uh, so, and this year we're doing this really big project here. That's um, one of the biggest projects they've ever done. So um, that's the end of that part. Now I'm gonna think I have to go out of screen share and then go back into the other thing that I wanted to share. Um, and hopefully this will then go on, um, back to, yes, okay. Now let's see if I can get this to go large here. Um, okay, so um, what this is, is the building plans for my uh, system. Now, the reason I'm showing this is just to get you an idea of what you could do yourself because every uh, basement would be different. But, um, you know, a lot of the plans are, are uh, instructive. For instance, it's important that when you're putting the outside door here, you remember to keep your depth on this wall 18 inches because that's standard shelving. And, and so you make sure that you've got that kind of spacing around um, that um, think this thing through. So here's a, a list of all the tools that one needs. Uh, there's this spreadsheet has um, uh, uh, more detailed material list and it has pricing. And what I'll say is it cost a bit more than the pricing there. The total cost of this project was about $3,000 um, when um, it, um, materials alone. Um, we didn't use Hemlock shelving, I see there though. But so here's the step-by-step -step building instructions um, that, um, you know, what you need to do first. Some of this specific to my house, like demolish entire ceiling. Um, usually you would just take out the ceiling in your own space if you have it a ceiling. Um, anyway, uh, here's, you know, the framing, the venting, the insulating, um, a lot of the, the details, um, uh, what we do on the walls, step-by-step, step, the ducting, uh, a little bit about the Arduino Raspberry Pi system, which we initially uh, thought it was going to be, but it's slightly different than that. And, and uh, you'll be hear more about that in a minute. Uh, and finally at the end here is, here's a list of 10 tips for fruit and vegetable storage in a root cellar. So some, some key storage tips to remember um, that are here, you, um, the later maturing crops store better than early ones and look for varieties that store better. The longer you do this, the more you'll learn. I'm early on the learning curve for this. Um, um, and there's always a lot to learn. Everyone in, in our climate used to know just about all of this because um, it was uh, how you lived through the winter. <laughs> um, you're checking the, the quality of the fruit and vegetables. You're, uh, you're curing the vegetables that, that need to cure first. Um, and different vegetables have different kind of curing. Uh, some are drying like the, the garlic. Um, a lot of squashes uh, need a period in which they're pretty warm to really dry out that exterior shell and to keep them um, going right. And, and here you've got things like the potatoes that need a fair amount of, of, cool, of um, humidity, but the squash don't. They're gonna be better in the cool room rather than the, uh, the moist room. Um, um, most vegetables don't really like to be washed. They'd rather just be wiped off. Um, there's a layer there on the outside um, that allows them to store longer. So getting your um, fruits and vegetables from your own garden or from a local grower is gonna give you um, stuff that's gonna last longer than if you get them from a standard commercial source. Um, uh, and um, so, uh, so, you know, and you can put your, uh, some of these things you can put into fresh leaves. Um, some of them you can put into sand or sawdust. 
Uh, here we're saying that, that getting fresh leaves each year um, is a lot easier and less messy than, than sand and sawdust. Um, um, you know, you want them to be somewhat dry on the outside before you put them in. Um, so that um, you want humidity, but you don't want water on the surface of them. Um, you you want to get as close as you can to the target temperatures and moisture levels for the crop. And, um, and here, um, some things like carrots and beets, like a colder temperature, tomatoes, winter squash, like it warmer. Um, and some fruits and vegetables, especially fruits, give off ethylene gas. And so um, you want to store things that don't react well to ethylene gas away from the vegetables or, or fruits that give it off. So, um, sometimes you can wrap fruit in um, newspaper, which contains the gas. Um, now, um, you know, don't let them freeze, of course. Um, and you want to track your, your temperature. Um, and, and now finally, here's a list of fruits and vegetables that may create ethylene gas and some that would be damaged by excess ethylene gas. Um, you could also have similar lists of things that like to be cooler and um, a little bit warmer, some that like to be a little bit um, um, more lower uh, humidity and higher humidity. And there's various ways of doing all this. I mean, so put some things higher up in the root cellar. We'll have less humidity and will be a little bit warmer than stuff that's at the bottom on the floor level. Um, so, and you can also learn how to bring in more than just fruits and vegetables into your root cellar. You can store a lot of cured meats um, in root cellars and in cold rooms. It's a very traditional way of doing it. You also can store a lot of your fermented materials like your sauerkraut and kimchi and all. Um, it, um, once it's reached uh, a, um, a finished stage of fermentation, um, it doesn't want to be warm anymore. It'll, so you want to slow it down and keep it at that for as, until you eat it. So, uh, and there's many other things you can do in your root cellar. Now, let me see if I can get out of this and get back to something else again um, to add to this. Um, the, um, hmm. well, I don't see it there. Um, Hmm, doesn't put me where I wanted to be. Well, um, let me see if I can drop out of it from this this way. Um, yeah, I think this is gonna get me where I wanna go. <laughs> no, it didn't. Um, oh, here it is. Um, I, I want to thank all the people at, at Clarity who were a, a part of designing all this for me and doing it. They really went out of their way. And um, Clarity is a, a company in um, headquartered in Burnside. Um, the show is called Eyes for the Job. Um, there's a lot of episodes. Um, the, um, the fellow who's the lead is Chris Judge. Um, and um, I've gotten to know a lot of the other people there, um, the uh, executive producer, Del Stevens, and, and, and Del Lecky is the director. Um, the um, uh, Burton Howell was out uh, doing assistant directing. Uh, my son just so happens to work there. And um, that may or may not have anything to do with the fact that I got this wonderful contract or not, <laughs> that they did this. So that's, that's wonderful for me. Let's see. So yes, I've already given you all the, the names of these people. Um, and um, um, Eyes for the Job um, at 
Clarity is, you know, that's that's their web page, and uh, AMI uh, as um, one of their featured uh, programs is I for the job now. AMI specializes in doing programming for people who, uh, in particular, are visually impaired. Um, are, are, and um, so this has something that is, um, they, they're calling it describe video. So rather than subtitles for people who are blind, um, are someone talking over for someone who's blind, or for someone hard of hearing, um, um, subtitles. What they do here is they design the language of the of the discussions so that if you hear what's being said, you understand what's going on, even if you can't see it. So it's it's quite innovative, and um, I've really enjoyed working with them on on this and several other things. Now. Um, the, the final thing that um, as soon as uh, Bill Morrow has finished his presentation, one thing that we might talk about now or maybe as soon as um, everyone else is presented is there are a lot of different ways to do things a little more simply than the fairly complex uh, control system that I have. It's a, it's a real Cadillac one. It's beautiful. I posted the uh, the link to learn a whole lot more about it and but it would be great to have discussion some people say we'll just get an old refrigerator um, that's uh, our freezer rather that's um, the chest type with the opening at the top and get a you can get a controller for it that doesn't allow it to freeze uh, usually it's from the brewing industry um, catalogs that you can get those so that you keep it just above freezing at about three to five degrees. So, um, and I think one of the people on here, uh, David Maxwell, I believe, did a, um, a greenhouse controller for ventilation. I'm not sure, maybe Cam did one too. So there's a lot of ways of doing it more simply. Um, you can even just um, put monitors on the walls and come down and learn what you need to do. But this is an exciting one. We're really excited to, to change this and, and um, I don't know, I haven't seen if there are any questions I should answer now, if anyone has them or we can go directly on to Bill Morrow. Mel or Bob? Uh, David, there is one question, but I've got another one first, just to jump in. Has the episode aired yet on Eyes for the Job about your um, root cellar? Oh, this episode won't air um, until next fall, probably. We don't even know exactly when. I see. Uh, it's not scheduled. Uh, the, the, the season is not delivered quite yet. I see. Okay. So they're, they're, um, and they, so it's not scheduled, but we'll try to, to do it. And it's going to be a lot of fun because it'll show all the different stages of construction there. And they, they, they make a lovely little storyline that goes with it. And it's, it, it, it was a lot of fun um, working with them uh, on this. So uh, one question uh, right now uh, from Mike is, um, um, what about not attracting or keeping rodents or other pests out? Anything specific? Um, uh, yes. Inside this outside vent, um, there is a very fine, um, uh, rabbit wire, you know, the quarter inch mesh screen on that. Plus, this is high enough that a mouse doesn't get up to it. And it's when it's tiny enough that a, um, a rat can't get into it. Um, and it certainly um, squirrels couldn't get in there. So this, th these four vents are the only place um, there. And also inside the building, even if you get something in your building, they're not gonna be able to get through to it. Um, and that is partially because um, these walls here are th these things, it's a cement board um, and it's um, 
it's it's cement it, it's you know it's a quarter inch of cement and sealed really and cut really tightly so critters aren't going to get through that uh, um, another question david uh from mike um his basement is somewhat damp and has white chalky mold or spalling which forms on the walls did that come up for you was that an issue or something that needs to be remediated first? Um, no, I've never had that much humidity, although um, I do run dehumidifiers. I'm rather hoping that the humidity levels in the rest of the building will now be lower um, than they were before, because I think a lot of my humidity was not only coming from condensation, but was coming in, uh, well, for condensation around the water tank and maybe some of the outlets. And so we sealed some of the outlets um, better, like uh, outlets there and there uh, are now much better sealed. And I've got a few more things to do, but I'm, I'm, it does feel drier already in my house by having sealed this in really thoroughly. Uh, do you have uh, fans in both vents, the hot air and the cold, the hot air out and the cold air in? Yes. And um, on the, the hot air out, this vent here blows up. I think you can probably see my cursors. That fan blows up and out and the, the, and the cold air in the fan that's right here, it blows down this way. And so there's four fans total. Yeah. Um, it also, when it's colder outside by quite a bit than inside, it um, there's natural convection currents there too. So okay. it's possible that you could get enough ventilation just by having natural convection, um, uh, but particularly when it's pretty cold out. Okay. And, and the other thing is that if, if it starts to seem like it's too cold there, um, what I would do is um, put something in at the, uh, uh, put a block of wood under the bottom of, of the air, cold air intake, like down here. You just put a, something that blocks it off if you think it's getting too cold in there. But that's not so likely to happen. Yeah. Uh, just so you know, David Maxwell, who you mentioned, um, he says his experience is you need heavy gauge wire, not fine wire mesh to keep the critters out because they can just chew right through the, the fine uh, mesh wire. Oh, it, um, it, 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 it's, it's rabbit wire. It's, it's not screen. It, it is heavy gauge wire. Okay. Um, and then Deborah asked, do you have a photo of all, all your uh, food in cold storage? Um, well, here's just some of my beer. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I did. I'm still getting more of it in here. So um, the shelves are, are not full yet. Okay. Um, and I've been working with um, an, an injury um, so I haven't really gotten full loads here, but um, uh, I have about 200 pounds of, of apples and, and root vegetables in there, and I could get a, a lot more soon. This, I got this right a little bit after the, the peak season when things are being harvested, um, but I will be able to buy bulk items um, for, for some of my things and plan to do that soon. All right, thanks, David. There may be some questions later that we can come back to, but I think we should probably move on. Um, and Bill, I'd like to introduce you uh, briefly, Bill Morrow. And as I understand it, you were involved in helping David with some of the design and the electronics. Uh, Bill is very actively involved in the Halifax Makerspace, uh, which is a great thing going on. Um, and as I understand, you've got software and some engineering background. So Bill, please go ahead. All right, thanks, David, or uh, Robert. Uh, and thanks for the 
description of your uh, root cellar, David. It was an interesting project, and I, I hadn't known about some of the the earlier steps. Um, so yeah, we we were contacted. Um, oh, can someone let me? I guess Mel, can you let me share my screen? If that works. Uh, we were contacted by by uh, Clara C uh, about whether we were would be interested in in uh, working on the electronics part of the the project and uh, there was uh, basically two of us that were we thought would have the um, experience to do that and uh, I was the last one to step back kind of so so I volunteered to to take that on. Um, uh, and partly because of, uh, you know, I was interested in the project and, but also to um, promote the, the maker space to a wider community and let people know about what we are up to. Um, and then as, as I got into the details, there were some areas where I didn't, didn't know how to do this. So it was a nice learning experience too. And then just the fun of, of going through the, um, that, that busy weekend when the, the whole thing came together was, was, it, um, was pretty nice too. So I, I assembled a, um, a short presentation we did at the Makerspace for a, sort of a show and tell thing. And uh, so I'm just gonna go through that, uh, same, same kind of presentation um, pretty quickly. And then if, if anybody's interested in any specific details um, and uh, we can go into that a little bit. I, I have assembled uh, some instructions on the specific, specifics of the electronics and the software is in, in on that too. So, um, so yeah, this was like uh, David said, part of a, a television show, uh, do it yourself, reality TV sort of thing. Um, uh, we were approached to to build uh, the smarts to make this a you know a 21st century root cellar. Um, so uh, this is what it looks like when it was finished. The the, the bulk of it is is. Uh, circuit board with a power supply. And I'll show this in a little bit more detail, but um, we've made an attempt to make it withstand uh, conditions that electronics don't always like. But really, really high humidity isn't great. Uh, high humidity is good for electronics. They don't mind that. It stops um, static electricity and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, this is going to be a, a real learning experience for principally for David and then for, for anyone else about what you can do inside a you know, a, a cool, humid uh, uh, climate. So the container that it's inside is a, a piece of plywood and then the lid of this food storage container and then everything screwed through those two uh, layers into the wall. So the lid is uh, moved off the wall a little bit and then the bottom of the container snaps onto the, on top of the whole, um, uh, arrangement and that allows you to run the wires in behind and keep that lid uh, tight and so the wires where where there's a chance for humidity to leak in uh, you can seal those in really well and uh, control that so uh, we'll see how that works out I think it's I think it's it's got a chance of working well but David one thing I thought of after I left the last time you might want to paint this wood or, or put something on it so that I, I thought of that uh, just a couple of days ago because it's it's going to be in a humid and this is just ordinary plywood. Um, this is a little bit of a close up, but there was a question about the fan. So the the um, the fan in in this one, <clears throat> and these are uh, surplus computer fans, fans used to like the, in the back of your if you're sitting in front of a computer right now. Uh, we've the, one of the things the makerspace one of the best features of the makerspace is a huge pile of junk in, in our in our facility. So if you're building a project, working on a project, there's a decent chance we've got the parts already there. And so these were uh, scavenged by one of the members from uh, he works at a a company that does big uh, server kind of things. And so these are pretty uh, high end, uh, nice computer fans. What's a little strange about them is they want 48 volts, but uh, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later, later. That's an unusual kind of voltage for these, these things usually. Um, as David said, cold air blows down to the bottom, hot air is sucked out and sent outside from the top. Um, we'll see if that's even necessary. Like, like David said, maybe natural convection is good enough. 
Uh, this is a little bit more of an inside view of how the thing works. So there's a big mess of wires just scattered around. Uh, David had plans of uh, putting a, a plastered or cob sort of finish on the inside wall. And so I didn't want to mount the wires more permanently. Um, so eventually I think these should be anchored a little bit better, but you can see them uh, sneaking through the lid of that food storage container and going in. At the top here, we've got four uh, 48 volt supplies going to those fans. Uh, there's a, a section of the green, the green board here is the main brains of the operation. The top part is taking the low level voltages, like the kind of things your cell phone works on or, or uh, any other small electronics work on much lower voltages. So there's a, a circuit here that, that uh, takes the signals from that lower, lower voltage circuit and, and puts it out at the more uh, power uh, hungry fan uh, levels of voltages and currents. The actual circuit here is a thing called a uh, node MCU. It's uh, like uh, David said, similar, and you program it much like Arduino, if people have heard of that. Uh, if you haven't, I, I'll go into it. At, if, if anyone asks a question, I can go into that a little bit more. But it's a it's a unique enough word that you'll you'll find about it just Googling away. Uh, what's why I went with this one is the the little silver box here is uh, a Wi-Fi uh, capability right inside the the uh, the microcontroller. You don't have to add on extra pieces to get onto your Wi-Fi. It's it does networking just um, inherently within the device. Uh, so really popular. These are five dollars or so in in uh, uh, you know Amazon or or one of the Chinese uh, websites. A little bit more if you go from a North American uh, site. But uh, the great thing about that whole environment is the the community, the ecosystem that's built about up about it is is rich. There's a lot of different uh, projects people have done. A lot of uh, software already written to interact with different things and they're very helpful with each other. Some, some, uh, some of these kind of communities are, there's, there's sort of a snobbery and you have to prove your credentials to get in there, but this isn't like that at all. They're very helpful. The, the people who know what they're doing are, are very helpful with, with newcomers and uh, people like to share their work. So that's kind of the, the, the real brains of the operation that make it, as David said, a Cadillac uh, system. This takes the uh, same kind of power as your smartphone. So there's a, I took a wall ward and cracked the plastic case up and, and just to make sure the thing worked. And so this is a five volt supply. And then this big silver box here is uh, household 120 volts AC to 48 volt DC for the fans. Uh, probably a bit bigger than it needs to be, but I wanted to err on the side of caution and make sure I didn't get this too hot. Uh, because we're sealing it, I didn't want it generating too much heat and then basically cooking itself. Um, so right next to it is uh, a little temperature humidity sensor and you can see the wire goes there and um, I think we ran them through the top too. So these thinner wires are coming over here and hooking into the bottom. Uh, so it's, it's permanently mounted with a chunk of tape <laughs> to the wall. Um, so in, in, in time, uh, uh, this could be mounted better. We decided to put, mount them in the middle of the wall to get sort of an average of the temperature of the rooms. Um, so, so that's the, the bulk of the system. There are two of these temperature humidity sensors, one in each room, and then a temperature only sensor routed out through the vents to outside. Um, I've got a, another project I've got on the go here to, to build my own uh, weather system that measures all sorts of things. And I've had a lot of trouble with outside the humidity temperatures. It, it, the sensors just don't seem to last, uh, especially in, you know, uh, the kind of conditions we have where, now where it's really humid and, and, and cool. <clears throat> uh, to, in addition, there's uh, two humidifiers. Um, uh, so you can see down here, just uh, an ordinary, um, mister that you'd use if you had a dry cough or that sort of thing. Um, it's plugged into a smart switch. 
So the, this one is a Sonoff brand, really popular. Um, they're $10 or so, something like that. Uh, again, talk on the Wi-Fi and the, the insides of this are actually very, very similar to, to my little board here. The, the same kind of, uh, essentially the same equipment. Um, what I did is uh, these come out of the box with um, software from the manufacturer that works with your phone or some such thing, but there's a, a large community built up around putting your own firmware, your own software on there. Uh, so one of the varieties is called uh, Tasmoda. And um, what that does, I'll, I'll show you a little bit here later um, how that works. It, it, it lets you, it just gives you more control about that. And, and anything they're doing that you're not too keen on, you know, Wi-Fi going outside, it's not just talking to this, it's talking to Mark Zuckerberg or whatever. Um, not if the one I fan Mark Zuckerberg fans out there, but you know, you don't know what some of this equipment's doing. So, so this is a chance to uh, limit what the, the device capability and make it do just what you're doing. Um, so we got that all hooked up. Uh, it took a little bit of work to, to get the, the wiring the right length. And I've, I've left them generously long. They could be uh, trimmed and, and, and fit a little bit nicer. But when it's all working, uh, David goes on to his, his, uh, an address on his local, local network. He doesn't have to go out to the internet or anything. There's no traffic going anywhere except on his local network. And he sees a, a web page that uh, looks much like this. Um, there's a heartbeat that tells you the thing is alive. So it's, it's counting. Uh, we may risk it and, and see if David can show us live, uh, show it working and, and see what the heartbeat's up to. But, uh, this is seconds, so it's been alive for almost an hour. There's 3,600 seconds in an hour. It shows the humidity. Um, it's already pretty humid. Um, I, I haven't seen it in, in a couple of weeks, so it'd be nice to see what that's like. Temperature was still a little, little warm when you're out here. And and this is where, you know, other than seeing, you know, am I, am I going to, are my apples gonna rot by the time January comes along or are they gonna be in good shape? Um, you know, by the temperature. We can also see, you know, is there any cold air outside that we can suck in? Well, here, no, you know, we're already colder than outside. So this was, uh, I think I took this, obviously when it was a pretty warm day, but uh, two, three weeks ago, I think that I took the picture of it. And then down here are some buttons you can click on. So you click on any one of these, these turn on the four fans. Uh, and then down here, you can turn on the humidifier. So the fans are directly controlled by the, the device. So, and then the humidifiers go through those two smart switches. Um, one thing to make this work well is uh, on, on David's router, we assigned a permanent address to the devices. So uh, this first one is, is the uh, technical name for, for his root cellar monitor device. And then these other two are those sewn off switches. Um, and we made sure to reserve uh, the address so it would only be used by these and it wouldn't change. Um, something went funny there. I probably mistyped this. Um, so after I got it all installed, uh, David says, well, I can run one humidifier, the other one doesn't work. And it was because I had, there was 249 here and his address that was reserved was actually 248. So we got on a Zoom meeting and, and uh, walked him through how to look at that and we got that working. So it's still working, David. I think we still have two humidifiers going. Good. Uh, yeah. So just in a sort of in a quick summary of, of what I learned from it and, and I think uh, what people could take away for, for how to do something similar. Um, we had quite a bit of a challenge getting the Wi-Fi to work down in this corner of, of the basement. Uh, David's router is the diagonal opposite corner of the main floor, so it's a fair bit away. And then with all that extra insulation and the concrete board and that sort of thing, uh, at first the Wi-Fi just didn't work. It didn't have enough uh, oomph to get through those walls. Um, the solution we came up with was to put in a, a Wi-Fi extender. So the, the Wi-Fi is essentially a lot closer. 
Um, depending on your situation, you may want to go away from Wi-Fi to some kind of wired connection and maybe get away from the internet thing at all. What's nice about it is, is you can use your phone to, to have a look what's going on and to control it. I spent, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 hours uh, or more uh, writing this software. I had some similar things already uh, built. Uh, like I said, the community is really excellent on, on already having software, but it did take a while to, to get the software the way I wanted it. There's other existing things. These uh, three I've listed here all run on uh, the, the little boxes like that smart switch uh, back here. Um, this little smart switch will run any one of these, these three and there's other varieties. Uh, what you lose there is, is making it exactly fit your circumstance, but uh, you know, it might be to start with, you might just want to um, go with that smart switch and, and maybe some different software on it. Uh, the 48 volt fans, well, my, my you know, I, I do professional software delivery kind of things and, and you're always trying to justify your decisions to the customers. So what I would tell David is, well, the 48 volt fans were because you could use thinner wiring and, and, and uh, you know, save cost, thinner wires are cheaper and, and uh, you know, reduce blah, 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 blah. Well, really it's because we had some 48 volt fans that were really good quality. They were in the uh, Halifax Makerspace surplus pile uh, and it sort of backfired on me because I had to buy that, that power supply. Oh, Bill, I'd, I'd like to request maybe just another minute or two in the interest of time. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm done pretty much. So uh, whether the humidifiers are necessary, it was not, uh, well, well, that'll be interesting to see. And then finally, you could automate the whole thing. If it's so many degrees colder, bring in some cold air if we're not already so I left that out because I think this is a learning experience. I don't think we're ready to make those decisions. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's it uh, as far as um, uh, what I showed the makerspace. The only other thing I did want to, to advertise is um, I'll bring over, uh, can everybody see that web browser page here? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I do a little bit of experimenting with um, home automation. And so this is the same kind of information I'm getting out of my weather station. This is um, how it's charging itself with a solar power thing uh, visualized. So you can see some trends with that kind of stuff. And then the other thing is I have one of those smart switches on my um, heat recovery system. And so I put in a, a schedule to, um, it's so right down beside our guest bedroom. So, Bill, if people want to get a hold of you, um, can they reach you through Makerspace? Yeah, there's a, a good website, uh, HalifaxMakerspace.org. You should be able to find it. Um, okay. And then uh, uh, also, uh, let me just put that in here. All right. That's, so that's great because uh, uh, some people may want some advice if they're going to be setting up a root cellar and they want to do some automation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, then, then there's a, a contact page here. So uh, just info at Halifax Makerspace and it'll. That's it'll great. Off. Okay. Yep. So uh, yeah, if you don't mind, we, we do need to move on. Uh, and yep. David, I just want to say I had the thought that's fantastically um, um, high tech uh, cold storage space you got there. And it struck me, you know, with the, uh, the dashboard and the whole thing, how it's uh, effectively online, that you've heard of the uh, Donair web webcam. Okay, you know, King of Donairs has a webcam on their Donair. Oh, yeah. 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 So you need to do the same thing now, David. We all want to know at any point in time how your root cellar is doing. <laughs> well, that'll be the ne next thing, I guess. Uh, and I, I should say that uh, uh, I forwarded the link uh, to the Instructables um, article that uh, Bill made, and I believe that can link back to Bill there too. Can you put That's that in the chat box as well? And uh, while you're doing that, I do want to move on. I want to introduce uh, Cam Parnell. Cam is also a longstanding member of Transition Bay Steering Group. Uh, he lives in a off-grid home in, uh, in uh, Westwood Hills in Tantallon. 
um, a tech innovator for just about everything in terms of uh, a whole lot of ideas on growing food. And so Cam, I'm gonna turn it over to you um, and tell us how you're doing uh, cold storage at your place. Thanks, Bob. Okay, we're, we're going from one extreme to the other. David's setup is a extreme high tech, sort of the Learjet of um, cold storage. And what I've got is perhaps the bicycle of cold storage. For all those of you who were perhaps scared off by what was just shown, you don't have to do stuff. It's, it's fabulous what David's done. And if you're interested and have the inclination, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but you don't need to go to anything like that extreme to come up with reasonable cold storage. My cold storage is vastly simpler. I'm gonna call up some stuff here, stand by. Okay, I've got two cold, two storage areas in my house. There's sort of a cool area and a colder area. This is down the basement and it was originally intended to be my cold storage, but it never gets cold enough because it's surrounded on three sides by the house. So although it is insulated and ventilated, it never gets all that cold. So instead of uh, use it, putting, using it for most vegetables, we use it for um, some things. We uh, use garlic stores well there. So we've got the garlic down there, but mostly we use it for things like things that we have preserved like pickles, uh, tomato sauce, uh, applesauce, that sort of stuff is what gets stored down in that area. The other area that I've got is out in the garage. It's uh, just a section of the garage that I have put basic, very basic walls around. This didn't cost much, it's a few, two by fours, some uh, OSB and a little bit of fiberglass insulation. And it's in it, it's, it's sized so that I can put crates on the left hand side, you can see the storage area, the stuff on the right is just my wood storage. But on the left are the crates that we put the stuff that we grew here into. You can see in that picture, there's some onions and down below that potatoes. Uh, those are on bins that I've added little wheels to so that they can slide into. Um, the garage never gets that cold because it, it is insulated, but, all, but most of it's outside. Um, but not shown here, there is a door that I can put over this to close it. So if we're getting extreme cold weather, if it gets down to minus 15 or below, you need to close it off to um, allow it to stay relatively warm. Um, there's some onions and potatoes that I've got stored there. Uh, with carrots and various other things, beets and whatnot, we will put in sawdust or um, peat moss to, to keep them moist. Uh, those are the parsnips all covered up in uh, sawdust there, again, in one of those wheelie bins. And way down at the bottom, I've got a very simple, uh, it's a thermometer and humidity measure thing with a maximum minimum on it. So I can tell what the maximum temperature, what the minimum temperature is. Uh, relatively warm day when I took that, it's saying 6.7 degrees. It's showing a high temperature of 21, but that was what, when it was in the house before I put it out there. Um, so that's about it. That's, that's all I've got for cold storage. Very simple, nothing automatic, um, but it, uh, it works quite decently. And that's, uh, that's all I've got to say about it. That's great, Cam. Thank you very much. And um, if anyone's got any questions for Cam, uh, put those in the chat box. Um, I think we can get to them um, at the end, if, if nothing coming in now. Um, I think at this point, it's probably my turn. Um, and I'd like to say a few things um, about how we do things here. Um, when it comes to cold storage, I started to think about it. We've got vegetables stored just about everywhere. Um, and I started with thinking about outside. Um, so there's still a lot of things in the garden. It's going to be December soon. Uh, we've had nights where it's seven below. And I'm amazed how many vegetables we're still harvesting directly outside, uncovered uh, in the garden. Uh, there's uh, tot soy, which is a Chinese vegetable. It seems to be impervious to cold. We've got two kinds of parsley, the curly type and the Italian type looks absolutely beautiful. We've got kale, two kinds of kale. We've got collard greens. We've got Italian dandelion. Uh, then we've got leeks and another variety of uh, um, an onion called 
Tokyo white onion, which grows big and never bulbs, it starts to look like a leek at the end of the year. So those are also doing just fine outside and we're still harvesting quite a bit. Then we've got one unheated greenhouse, a little bit more protected, uh, but we've got spinach in there, picking a lot of spinach this time of year that was planted in uh, early September. Uh, spring turnip was planted in late August. Uh, some nice looking turnips in there. And then Claytonia or miner's lettuce. All of those are quite cold hardy uh, and doing quite well. So I think of them, they're not really growing much this time of year. Most of them are fully dormant. So I almost think of it like an outdoor refrigerator. Um, so they're just keeping and really waiting. Uh, the only issue maybe is trying to keep the deer off them because of course they're quite hungry this time of year. Um, but then um, we do start to bring things inside um, and it's a tricky transition because uh, like Cam, uh, we don't have much of a sophisticated setup. Um, I will go to sharing my screen here. Um, I want to show you our main storage. Uh, we have a fairly small garage. It's actually kind of a workshop with a garage door on it. And we keep it heated, it's electric heat, we keep it at about two or three degrees, so just above freezing. And beginning in about late, well, August and October, maybe mid-October, we start harvesting a lot of the storage crops and we put them into these big plastic tubs that you can see on the right side there, the black tops with the gray bottoms. So we start to put uh, vegetables in there. We keep them outside of the garage door because we're still you know, getting cold nights that time of year and it's cool during the day. So it's effectively like an outdoor uh, cold cellar. And then when the nights start to get too cold, when you start getting those five, six, seven below nights, we bring them inside uh, and store them just inside the garage door where it's only heated to two or three degrees. The other things you can see there, we've got three figs in pots. Uh, had a very nice fig crop this year. Figs will be uh, damaged if at about five, six below zero. So uh, these had been grown in a greenhouse. Uh, we pulled them out uh, in uh, late November, uh, potted them up, and then brought them into cold storage here. So they're protected for the winter. And then we'll pull them back out again in um, probably late April. They'll leaf out. Uh, and then in May, we'll put them back in the greenhouse for a summer crop. We've got a few other odds and ends in there, dahlias, um, and that's another, it's an ornamental flower. Uh, the tubers don't um, um, overwinter, uh, particularly if they get frozen, it will kill them. Uh, so those are dug up in the yellow tub and, and one of the white uh, pails. And then in the other pail, we've actually dug up some cabbage stems with roots and those are in cold storage. We're gonna transplant those back out in the spring. They're gonna root and they're gonna to go to seed. And that will be our uh, cabbage seed crop. And we learned, I learned that trick from uh, one of the workshops we did a couple of months ago um, with Yonder Hill Farm on seed saving. And then of course we've got uh, in here, we've got um, squash of different kinds. We also keep our garlic and our onions. Now, the nice thing about the, um, um, the tubs there is that um, this is what's inside. Uh, so we've got cabbage, potatoes, parsnips, beets, rutabaga in there. Uh, they all like it cool. They all like it relatively moist. Um, so one of the things that I started to do, my son uh, gave me a, uh, a small device. I'm gonna stop sharing here for a second and I'm holding this up. Um, I'm trusting that I'm gonna pin the video on me. I'm gonna hold this thing up. This is called a Kestrel drop. It's a little um, temperature humidity sensor that you can stream through your device, through your phone. So I can put this in one of those tubs I can walk in at any time, look at my phone, 
and it'll tell me the temperature and the humidity in there. So I can control it then um, how much humidity just by how uh, how tight the lids are. I can leave the lids slightly ajar and reduce the humidity. I can put those black lids on a little bit more tightly and increase the humidity in there. Um, so it's a nice low tech way to control things. Uh, we do get fairly good um, long-term storage. Now, when we get into the depth of winter, um, when it starts to get 10, 15 below outside, I do put a sheet of uh, um, styrofoam, like one of these uh, blue one inch thick sheets of styrofoam between the door and these tubs. Uh, because in the past, if I hadn't done that, I could start to get some freezing, freezing damage in there. Um, but it's worked quite well, uh, quite low tech. Um, now, the other thing that we do as well is uh, somebody many years ago gave us a, an old refrigerator. So we have that in there. I opened the door this afternoon, took a picture. Uh, we keep all of our fermented stuff in there. So you can see some of uh, this year's batch of sauerkraut. You can see kimchi, uh, a lot of our refrigerator pickles. We've got bags of um, Napa cabbage, bok choy, carrots that we harvested out of the garden. Um, and we also have several bags of um, sprouting seeds. So uh, long about in uh, February, we'll start sprouting uh, a lot of these uh, just for some or for winter greens to augment a lot of the other things that we have spinach and and uh, so on that we're able to still continue harvesting out of the garden. So that's a little bit about um, us and what we do here. It's worked quite well. Um, so I think uh, maybe to just uh, encapsulate thing. That's all I've got to say. But uh, just at a high level, it seems that cold storage you need cold. And um, it seems to be either uh, a basement, um, a garage that you can keep above freezing. Um, I've heard people uh, adapt a, um, what do you call them, a stairwell uh, that goes down from the outside into the basement. Um, there's a number of different sort of transition zones like that where it could be cool, uh, but it doesn't really get into freezing where you can look at uh, storing fruits and vegetables. And I think as many of us know, uh, not only stuff coming out of the garden, and if you got a bigger garden, it can be a lot of stuff coming out, but you know, starting in September, October, even now this time of year, you go out to the big garden centers in the valley or elsewhere, and you can buy those big 50 pound bags of things for pretty low price compared to what they would be at the produce counters in the grocery stores. So it definitely pays up, pays off to um, uh, stock up on things and have an effective way to do cold storage um, in the fall. So I think that's all, really all I've got. Um, we do have about 15 minutes left here. So this would be a good time um, if anyone has some questions. Um, there are a few that came in here. Uh, feel free to type them in. Um, now, Colleen asks uh, Cam, um, what can you do to adjust the temperature in, in your setup? Um, well, it, the one that's down in the, um, the basement, and I'm not expecting it to get cold, so I don't bother adjusting the temperature. The one in the garage, the only way I have of controlling the temperature is to close the door that leads into that area because it backs onto the house. So if I close the door, it'll keep it from getting freezing in there. But that really only, really only is an issue in extreme cold weather, minus 15 and below, you've got to worry about it. Above that, because the garage is adjacent to the house, enough heat leaks from the house into the garage. So I, I've, all I do is close that door in extremely cold weather and that's it, it's not, there's not much to it. Okay, uh, now Len asks probably for all of us, has anyone used steel door cutouts for insulation? So Len, not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, if you wanna come off mute, uh, maybe tell us a little more that might help. 
Yes, uh, the um, you saw that uh, outside door where they put the window in. They cut the, the hole in in the door, and those steel door cutouts go to the dump. I've used thousands of them now as insulation in various uh, projects I've done over the years. They usually run about three feet by uh, twenty-two inches. I see. So those, uh, it's usually probably got insulation in between the inner and outer steel. Is that, is that the idea? Yes. And I've, I've got a, a walking cooler and I've got four layers of it. So it's a uh, or six and that's free. It would be useful to know where you get these things. Uh, the, the uh, I get them from, there's three places in Sydney. I'm in Sydney area. And uh, there's three places in Sydney that, that actually put the, uh, you pick out your window and they'll cut the, the hole in, in the door and put your window in and they throw the steel door cut it out. Uh, I know the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, environmental group that did the uh, upgrade in their area in North End of Halifax, uh, the College Action Center. Uh, I told them about it and they got a, a tractor trailer load. That's really interesting. I like it. Wow, fantastic. Uh, now, um, I think a question for you, Bill, uh, from um, uh, Marguerite. I think you might have mentioned it. There was an item that the controls the temperature in a freezer to keep it just above freezing. Uh, you have more no. information on that, or was that David that mentioned that? I think that was Cam, uh, but but um, then well, the, the sensors David have and and or even uh, I mean the, the, they're wired. So you if you put one of them in the fridge and close close the door, you would still get the readings. The problems with um, I guess that Kestrel thing you would have is it's it you can't hear it once it goes inside steel, right? It'd be the communications would stop. So yeah, there there would be. I don't think I talked about anything like a freezer, but um, you could could get something like that. Uh, who who had the freezer that uh, they'd put the control thing on to keep it just above freezing? That was you, Cam. No, that wasn't me. Mm. David mentioned it. Uh, I mentioned it, but it um, yeah. it was something that uh, I, I read on the internet. It's, uh, it was someone in Southern California wanted to make a root cellar. Um, and there's no they, <laughs> a little they, bit they, more they, challenge they, down there. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't it would never work because you get down to a certain point and the, the temperature of the, the ground starts heating back up again. So then right. it just wouldn't work unless they're up in the high Sierras or something. Um, so, but you can buy controllers um, for that based on um, what the brewing industry uses. Um, to, to, to brew beer in. Um, so it, it sounds like we'd have to do some searching on the internet then, maybe to find those. Yeah, even my source didn't have that exactly. Now, can I ask if David Maxwell uh, is willing to talk a little bit about his system he designed for his ventilation of his greenhouse? He sent me some plans for it, um, but um, I just want to know if if he was being able to say anything. Or maybe it was even a coal cellar. I just see he wrote me something else. David, can you unmute? No? Okay. Well, he did post some things. <laughs> I, I could tell you about my roots uh, cellar. I used an old fuel storage tank, 23 feet long, eight feet in diameter, uh, buried it in and made it cut out a door. And uh, it's, it's worked quite well for oh, probably seven, eight years now. I, I think I figured out how to unmute myself. Oh, hi, David. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, I actually created a coal cellar um, Oh, a number of years back now, simply by digging out um, from the foundation under the front porch um, and then insulating that, ventilating it passively with vents uh, at the top on one side and the bottom on the other side, 
Um, and that works quite well. Uh, I monitor the temperature in the cold cellar uh, simply using a commercial um, unit made by Tempminder. They're not expensive. They, they cost, I think, 50 bucks or so. Um, and that actually allows you to monitor not just the cold cellar, but the outside and anywhere else you want. You get four uh, sensors with the unit. And uh, so you, you can monitor it and then I control the temperature in it uh, if it's getting cold, simply by putting a plug on the end of one of the ventilation tubes, um, just a plastic plug. Uh, and that works fine, except that you don't get cold enough temperatures until well into December or January. And I've had problems with the getting the food cold enough. Um, I mean, particularly now with the outside temperatures running 15 degrees, you'll never get your, your cold cellar down to any usable temperature. So that's the first thing. Um, and then yes, I have a, a solar greenhouse, a passive solar greenhouse. Um, and I control the temperature in that automatically with a unit that is, um, that it opens the ventilation um, traps. Um, and those are driven by a linear actuator, uh, which is driven by a very simple Arduino circuit um, that monitors the temperature using the same temperature uh, monitoring affair that um, you're using, um, the DHT22. Um, and, and then I output the fig signal from the Arduino to a dual relay module that isolates everything and allows me to run just about anything that I want because it's running on relays. I'm not going back into the circuitry um, and I don't have to worry about eddy currents and uh, back currents and things. Um, so that, that's, but that's automatic. That's, uh, I, I, don't, um, I don't even monitor that. Um, it, it just runs on its own and it's set up to open and close at specific temperatures. We would love to post a little bit about what you sent. Um, I don't think we can get all that up on the chat right now, but uh, I'll try to post it on the Facebook page and, and maybe at, at our, 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 our um, at a web page if we can, if, if that's okay with you, David. I could also mention on the uh, in the chat box, we do have a link. Uh, Bill, thank you for that Kestrel device that I mentioned uh, for monitoring temperature humidity. There's a link for that. And then there's also a link for the instructions uh, for both the um, uh, uh, the heating cooling system and for the construction of David's um, root cellar. So uh, you'll find that there as well. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, um, Jillian has been sending some photos and uh, please open those up. They're in the chat box, uh, fascinating, a very traditional design for a root cellar um, into a hillside. Uh, there's a, a stone um, facade on the hillside uh, with a, uh, wooden door and you can walk in and you can see what's going on inside the root cellar. So that's the traditional design. I've heard uh, to this day some of the highest per capita concentrations of root cellars are still in Newfoundland um, and there's even some towns that make that a tourist attraction. Uh, but we do know that there's some more modern root cellars starting to pop up in Nova Scotia. David's is maybe one of the newest but I can think of a couple of others uh, that people have built um, into their homes. Oh, there we go. Um, that's one photo. Now somebody asked, um, I think Bill, you had asked the question, um, does anyone know anything about ice houses, making ice in the winter? Um, 
and harvesting in July. Uh, can I jump in and, and uh, I've, I'm trying to uh, um, share and I hope you see it my my root cellar monitor working now. Bill asked me for it. And I'll note that although it's 9.2 outside that with just passive in the roots in the, the root cellar room, it's 10.9 C and the cold room, it's 11.3 C. So I've got so much insulation and so much passive ventilation and without using the, dehum the humidifiers, I've got 90% humidity in both of the rooms. So uh, it's working pretty well that way. So I'll stop screen sharing now, but you just wanted to show you that stuff. And uh, maybe I can make some noise even. You probably can't hear that, but I can. <laughs> That's making lots of noise in there, turning everything on. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Now back to your question to whoever you're talking to, Bob. Oh, um, yeah, there's some interesting comments coming in um, about caves and ice houses. Uh, Jillian mentioned Collingwood Caves in Ontario. Um, also one at Fortress Lewisburg, Louisburg. Um, Someone asked Sandra, they have an old shed outside and are wondering if they can convert it into cold storage. So that's a great question. I know a lot of people have small outbuildings of different kinds um, and how well could that be turned into a cold storage? Um, Cam, David, anyone want to take a stab at that? Sure, I don't see why you couldn't convert it into a cold storage. You'll need to insulate it so that you're, you're isolated from the big temperature changes and probably have some way of letting the cold in and out, but it's, it's definitely doable. It's, you could, if you could find those uh, insulated door panels, that might be a good cheap way to insulate it. But uh, yeah, there's lots of possibilities. Yeah, it strikes me that the main uh, issue, uh, because it's above ground, um, is the really cold extremes in the winter time. When you get those 15 below, sometimes even 20 below, we don't see too much of the 20 below, but certainly the 15 below, we get a few of those every winter. And if that creeps inside that shed, even if it's insulated, you could lose a lot of crops just because they'll freeze. Um, so it's really that insulation question, as Cam mentioned. So if you know, it may be ways uh, even inexpensively, depending on how big the shed is, one idea is you could get a whole lot of bales of straw and just line the inside walls with bales of straw and then put some some kind of critter critter proof containers in the middle where you could store your vegetables. Another possibility if you don't have it fully occupied with vegetables is put containers full of water in there because they will moderate because they've got a large thermal mass they will keep it from cooling up or, or warming or cooling down or warming up it'll slow it down which on extremely cold weather will be helpful yeah that's a great idea but there's good reason why traditionally people would uh, dig a hole in the ground for the root cellars because the earth naturally moderates it and brings in all of this um, uh, humidity as well so it's that is the simplest way, but uh, mine is in the basement because you can get to it in the winter and not have, and we're, we're not used to, to needing to do that. People used to go out, they'd have to go out and dig their way into the root cellar to eat. Um, and if you were isolated and you didn't have a good root cellar in the winter, you, you wouldn't have any food through the winter. Uh, so they were willing to do it, but we're not now. So having it in the basement makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But uh, that's, that's like a cave or being it underground is what I'm trying to imitate, in fact. Yeah. Yeah, Jillian points out that um, uh, cold, the, the ground is naturally, um, has a consistent temperature all year round. And I remember seeing photographs of some very simple cold storage techniques where people would get a barrel of some kind and just bury it in the ground and at an angle so, and then there'd be a little opening at the front so they can open and close it. 
and they put a whole lot of vegetables in there. Maybe they cover it with some uh, leaves or a straw or something for a little extra insulation. But that's really all it takes. And there's nothing like the earth to maintain a good consistent temperature at just the right level. Or, or bury a freezer, an old freezer in there. Um, if you can, that's, that's a good way to do it too. Yeah. That's great. Okay, well, we're coming up on uh, our 90 minutes here and uh, we did cover a lot of ground. I think um, um, there might be a few more questions coming in. Um, so here, Mike's got a question on how long could root vegetables last in cold storage? Cam, any, I, you want to take a stab or I, maybe I could it, go. It on. varies depending on the vegetables and, your, and on your cold storage. It really, it's, there's no definitive answer to that. It, it depends on a whole lot of things and it varies from vegetable to vegetable. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I can think of uh, a lot of commercial growers, market gardeners, some of my friends, uh, that do a lot of market gardening, go to the farmer's markets and stuff. When they get serious and they have high volume, they actually have big uh, like walk-in refrigerators, coolers. So they have a consistent temperature, consistent humidity, and they can keep vegetables well into the spring that are good quality that they can still sell at the farmer's markets and that sort of thing. And they're taking it seriously because it's livelihood for them. Um, and they're trying to maintain just that optimal condition. Um, but uh, uh, Bob, uh, uh, just anecdotally, the sort of the opposite extreme. When I was a, a young fellow, my folks um, kept uh, our garden harvest in uh, plastic garbage pails full of sand, uh, carrots and whatnot. So um, they grew up in the depression and they knew all about this kind of stuff and, and did a, a somewhat of a job of passing on to me, but we ate those vegetables. It, when it was just down in the basement, it wasn't, wasn't particularly cold. It was probably, you know, 15. And we ate those all winter. The uh, carrots got a little soft and not too great. And the potatoes got kind of, uh, they're probably starting to get fermented or something. They got really sweet and, and soft and not particularly tasty, <laughs> but, uh, but we ate them. That, that's what was for dinner and we ate them. Uh, and if, if you put a little bit of effort into making carrot soup or, or French fries or whatever, they were fine. So, yeah. yeah. So well, all winter, all winter at least. Yeah. I suspect in the years ahead, we're going to be relearning a lot of that old lore on yeah. how to do things. I do note that with carrots in particular, if, if it's, if they're gone dormant and it starts to get above oh, maybe 10, 12 degrees on a regular basis, maybe up to 15 degrees, the tops will start growing again. Yeah. The other off. problem we had is uh, the lids came off and the cats got in that sand and did their cat thing. So some of them tasted worse than others. Right. <laughs> Wait, that's not a carrot. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there you oh, yeah. go. <laughs> that's wild. Yeah. Well, um, Right now, I'm reading that um, they expect a lot more people in the United States to be without food a lot this coming year, uh, this winter uh, that we're entering into. So things like what we're doing here um, not only save money, but they should give us a lot more security and resilience against changes like that. And I, I think it even it's, it's a really good idea to learn these things and, and invest in it now. I agree. That's why we do webinars like this. Exactly. Okay, well, um, I think we should wrap it up. We've had some great uh, uh, comments from people, questions, um, greatly appreciated. I think we had, uh, we peaked out at um, a little over 30 participants. Um, and I know that we didn't give a whole lot of warning of when we were going to be doing this in terms of advanced promotion and so on. Uh, so we're really glad people are paying attention uh, to our emails, to Facebook, and do stay tuned. Uh, we're going to have some more events coming up. I think we're going to have a down month here in December. Uh, but as I mentioned, we may be doing some greenhouse 
uh, webinar with Nikki Jabor either January or February, and we've got on, on a, a March uh, 25th, I believe it was. Um, no, Mar yes, March 25th, Thursday, scheduled for uh, rocket stoves and solar cookers. So please join us uh, in the future. Look forward to seeing you again. And sometime in the near future, this, this spring or summer, we're going to have our 10th anniversary uh, grand celebration. And that's gonna be a lot of fun. So let's, let's hope we can actually do this in person, um, but um, we're gonna do it. One way or the other, there we go. Yeah. All right, thanks everyone and have a good evening. Thanks y'all for coming.